What's good, TMG fam? It's your boy Ellen, and I'm back with another reaction. How y'all feel? Welcome back to the channel. Salute. Listen, we are still. And notice, I said we. We are still, to this day, fascinated with Ted Bundy, bro. We are still fascinated to this day. Like, it's, it's, it's not new to us. I, I think it's... Maybe it's because of just the heinous act that he committed. The, the and, and if you are new to Ted Bundy, bro, you are about to witness probably or hear about one of the most notorious, notorious serial killers ever, ever. You know what I'm saying? Um, the the title of this video is "How They Caught Serial Killer Ted Bundy," right? Um. It's been since the late '80s he was he was executed. I, if memory um, serves me correct, it was the late '80s, and we're still because we can't grasp in our mind how somebody could murder upwards to what was it high twenties, low thirties amount of women he killed. It, it just, just, just high 20s, low 30s, like it was nothing. Like it was nothing. And if, if, if I can remember correctly, they didn't even know he confessed to more while being in prison. Like his brain should have been donated. His body, like, his whole entire body should have been donated to science so they could see and figure out what made him, what was wrong with him, what was going on in his brain. Ted Bundy was a lunatic, bro. But you know what was even scarier about him? You know what was even crazier? He just looked like a regular Joe. Regular Joe Schmo. Regular Joe. That's to me what, which from the pictures I saw, he looked like a regular Joe. We're going to get into this video, man. Prepare yourselves, you know. A young woman walks down an alleyway on her way home from college, illuminated only in small puddles of light by the lamps above her. Little does she know that a man will be waiting for her as she emerges into the car park. Poor soul, she thinks, after seeing that well-dressed man is struggling to carry books to his Volkswagen Beetle. Especially as one of his arms is in a sling, she walks over to him and offers assistance, to which the polite and softly spoken man gives her his utmost thanks as she takes some of the books and leans down to place them in the passenger seat. He posed no threat. Come on, fellas, we know women. We know him just as good as they know themselves. If he'd have been looking crazy, if he'd have been looking weird, if he'd have gave off any signs that he was this crazed, deranged, ladies wouldn't even have gave him the time of day. They wouldn't have looked his way. They would have kept going and they'd have sped up their walk, right? He looked like a regular Joe. So he was, he posed no threat he looked like. So she was willing, willing to go help him. He hits her over the head with a tire iron. He gets into the driver's seat and leaves the scene. He'll strangle her like he did many others. He'll do unspeakable things to her. He is the quintessential maniac. His name is Ted Bundy. The scene we've just described to you was the modus operandi of this particular serial killer. Well, when he had planned his murders. Bundy's thing was to use his good looks, his speaking skills, and his educated demeanor to lure people into his trap. At times, he'd put his arm in a sling or even walk on crutches to give his victims a false sense of security. How harmful could a man be on crutches, one dressed in a suit, driving a cute car? This is why he was so hard to catch. He just didn't fit the profile of a serial killer, one who did absolutely disgusting things to people at the moment they died and after they died. He probably should have been caught much earlier than he was. After all, when young women went out and never came back, on a few occasions, witnesses came forward and said they had seen a man lurking around, a man with one arm in a sling, a man that drove a VW Buck, 
22-year-old Brenda Carol Ball was last seen talking to a guy in a car park who had brown hair and an arm in a sling. Soon after, Susan Elaine Rancourt went missing, never to return. Two people came forward after that and said they'd been approached by a man who wore a sling. He'd asked them for help putting some books into his car, a VW Beetle. Then, on June 11, 1974, University of Washington student Georgianne Hawkins went missing. Her body would never be found. We know that she'd been with her boyfriend and she left him after midnight on her walk home to her sorority. Now, 74, obviously I wasn't born. But if you were born in 74, what was the times like when this is going around? Are you, is it on the news to which is making you nervous to even go outside? Are they, are they administering curfews or what precautions were they taking back then? Like, like paint the scene for me so I know what, what was it like? Obviously, we're fascinated because we keep revisiting this thing. And I, I, like I said, I include myself in that. Guilty. But what was the temperature at the time? Not literally. I know some people would just be a... And, and put the temperature. No, I mean, what what was the tone? What was going on? You know, hearing this on the news, another woman's body has gone missing. Another woman has gone missing, body not found. Be on the lookout, VW Beetle. Were you allowed to even walk alone? Were you allowed to, to you know what I'm saying? Like, did, did you need to be in a house by a certain time? Did they have you have a suspect? Uh, uh, a sketch of them like what was it like I, I i guess i gotta know already house she was spotted by a male friend who was driving a car he shouted out of the window hey george what's happening she chatted with him for a minute or two and expressed that she was a bit nervous about her upcoming spanish exam later witnesses told the cops that they'd seen some guy skulking around in an alleyway close to hawkins's a guy whose arm was in a sling one woman said he'd asked her to help him load a briefcase into a light brown Volkswagen Beetle. Little did she know at the time how close she was to being murdered. Hawkins wasn't so lucky. She fell for the trick, as any helpful person might. We know what happened to her because Bundy later talked about it. When she was close enough to his car, he hit her over the head with a crowbar, which knocked her clean out. When she came around, she was obviously confused. Although, to Bundy's surprise, she seemed to think that he'd turned up to help her with Spanish. She was evidently in shock. This is what Bundy said about that. It's odd the kinds of things people will say under those circumstances. He strangled her and dumped her body, a body he would return to on at least three occasions. You could only imagine how demented he was returning to a body that was decomposing. He had his reasons, but we'll get to that. Bundy was brazen, there's no doubt about it. He didn't ever think he'd be caught. He thought he was too intelligent for the police. After all, he'd worked in politics. He worked as an assistant director of the Seattle Crime Prevention Advisory Committee, where he wrote a... <laughs> Can you believe that? Can you believe that? That's why I said he's a regular Joe. Look where he worked at. He figured he had inside information on how to elude the police. He was going to outsmart them. But better yet, bro, you returned to a body how many times? For what? And for, I'm hoping it's not what I'm thinking. You sick individual if that's the case. Paper on rape prevention. He did a stint at the Department of Emergency Services where he talked about missing women and how to find them. And that's likely why Bundy didn't have any qualms about returning to the alleyway from where he picked up Hawkins. The day after the abduction, he was there at the same time as the police, hiding in plain sight as he picked up one of the girl's shoes and her necklace. If he wasn't picking up girls in a car park or close by one, he was sneaking into basements while they slept and then bludgeoning the victim with some kind of iron bar. Bundy was like the boogeyman, a serial killer that crawled through windows and viciously attacked people while they were at their most vulnerable. But he was also a con artist. He played confidence tricks and he was very good at it. Investigators knew that when girls went missing, at times a man was seen with an arm in a sling. A man that owned a VW Beetle. Surely Bundy was easy prey after that. How many VW Beetles were there in those areas when the abduction happened? Areas dotted around the Pacific Northwest. The reality was Bundy's reign of terror was only in the early stages. The public and police were worried, that's for sure. Young folks stopped hitching rides and many became fearful of talking to strangers or leaving their windows open at night. And I think we give him way too much credit. He, I, just, 
I think it was the times. You know what I mean? We're talking, when did he finally get arrested? Like, late 70s? Was it early 80s? When did he get arrested? The final time, because I know he had got arrested one time before that. Excuse me. I know he got arrested one time before that, but the final time when he got arrested. Times were different back then, so you, you may have been able to elude them back then opposed to today's time. You know what I mean? So I think we give him too much credit as far as the intelligence, intelligence side, because intelligent to me is not still using the same, you know what I mean? Uh, the same sling. Uh, hey, bro, this is this is how I'm going to do it every time I just use a, a, a sling. Like, that's not intelligent to me. Like, switching it up would well, kind of seem a little bit more smarter. Maybe I, I, get, I get her this way, not using a sling every single time. You know, then the same vehicle, VW Beetle. Like, so I think we may give him a little too much credit as far as the intelligence side goes. Those with most to fear were young white women. Bundy's victims were almost always in their late teens or early 20s. They were Caucasian, and most of them were attractive. They studied at university and were said to be intelligent and gifted students. Another thing was the fact that each girl disappeared at a college where construction work was going on. Could the disappearances be linked, wondered investigators? They just didn't know. They had very little forensic evidence to work with, and there were no bodies. That didn't mean the cops thought the girls had just taken off someplace. Nothing about their personalities and state of mind suggested that. Only weeks after Hawkins went missing, two women were abducted in broad daylight at Lake Sammamish State Park, not far from the city of Seattle. Bundy had first approached five women in the park, and in what they later described as a Canadian or British accent, the man introduced himself as Ted. Ted, dressed in a pressed white tennis outfit with one arm in a sling, politely asked them if they could help him unload a sailboat from his bronze-colored Volkswagen Beetle. Four of them said no, but one followed him to his car. Thankfully, she ran away when she became aware that there was no sailboat. That day, Bundy managed to enlist one woman for help, and he later abducted another close to a restroom. Both would die. Did he kill one in front of the other? He once said that that was true, but close to his execution date, he recanted that terribly bleak detail. This is not a story about his crimes, though. What we want to know is how the hell did the police not get closer to Bundy, seeing as he was using the same car and the same sling trick and so the same modus operandi? He even told the girls that escaped that he was named Ted. What more did the cops need? A written... <laughs> I missed that one before. I didn't know he told the girls his actual name was Ted for real. I told y'all, we're giving Bundy way too much credit for 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 essentially no 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 we're not gonna, gonna give him that much credit on the intellectual uh, side no no we're not doing that not telling them your name using the same sling trick and never switching the vehicle confession they were closer but still a long way from getting it they at least now had good description of this ted guy and it did quite look like him in no time at all, this sketch appeared in many newspapers and was shown on TV. Remember that we said Bundy worked at the Department of Emergency Services? Well, one of his co-workers there saw the sketch and heard about the Volkswagen Beetle, and she knew she was looking at her colleague, Mr. Bundy. She made a call to the cops, as did another person that knew Ted Bundy. The cops at the time were receiving something like 200 of these calls in one day, and they quickly assumed that a clean-cut law student with no criminal record couldn't be behind the abductions. Serial killers didn't look like that, or so they thought. The heat was on, though, and Bundy knew it. A couple of months after his last murder, bones were being found. Those bones were the remains of his victims, scattered in various places where the cops hadn't thought to look. It was fortunate for Bundy then that he was accepted to study at the University of Utah Law School. He packed his bags and headed south in August of 74. He was only in Utah a month when he started killing again. He could not resist. He like a vampire, man. He couldn't, he couldn't resist that thirst for blood, bro. He could not resist it. Look, a month. You couldn't detox yourself from killing. No, it took a month, less than a month, you had, you had it again. Bro, September 2nd, I would like to know what his childhood was like. That's what I want to see another video done on, like people who knew him growing up. What type of person was he? What did he eat? What did he eat? What did he watch? What did he do growing up? So I can, you know what I mean? Refrain from doing anything. I don't want 
that type of feeling at all. Whatever possessed him to do what he did. A hitchhiker. October 2nd, a 16-year-old girl. October 18th, a 17-year-old girl from a pizza parlor. It turned out that she was the daughter of a police chief. After her decomposing body was found on a hiking trail, the post-mortem exam revealed that Bundy had kept her alive for perhaps seven days. Each had been subjected to the most brutal depravity, although Bundy admitted years later that after he killed them, he shampooed their hair and applied makeup to their faces, keeping them in a state that he liked. He wanted the physical possession of the remains, and he wanted to do what he wanted to them. He sometimes chopped them, sometimes kept heads in his apartment, and he dressed them in the way he wanted them to look. And then he took a photograph. When you work hard to do something right, he once said, you don't want to forget it. More abductions happened, more murders, as well as attempted abductions. The disappearances were reported in the media, and after reading about them, a woman named Elizabeth Klepfer who dated Bundy back when he was in Washington put two and two together. She not only called the King County cops and told them that she thought she had been dating the killer, but she also told the Salt Lake County Sheriff's Office and said the same. She was still talking to Bundy at this point on the telephone, but she didn't say anything about her calls. For her, the sketch looked like Ted Bundy. The car was Bundy's, and so the murders following him around were just too much of a coincidence. Bundy started then killing in Colorado. Things didn't change much. Death by blunt force trauma, sometimes strangulation, bodies dumped, mutilated, sometimes wearing clothes that weren't theirs. 1975 drew to an end and there were more victims, some whose bodies have never been found. 76 turned out to be another bloody year, so how come Washington cops weren't at the very least looking at Bundy? They only did that after they discovered a new toy, a computer, and a database. They found that they could input data about the murders and the computer would compare that data to data already in the system. Thousands of names were in that database, but only 26 names matched the crimes. Bundy's was one of them. The problem was connecting the Utah and Colorado murders to the Pacific Northwest murders. At the time, there were no large databases containing all the state's police departments. The fact of the matter was, while the cops should have known better after the tip-offs, because Bundy moved around, he managed to evade capture. But then, he was pulled over by a cop in a Salt Lake City suburb after he'd been driving around looking suspicious. On searching Bundy's car, the cop found quite the collection of suspicious items. And what was this dumb fool probably driving that VW Beetle. <laughs> I can't with this dude, man. Ah! Oh. <laughs> Adams, a ski mask, trash bags, handcuffs, a crowbar, lengths of rope, and an ice pick. All that was pretty much the consummate serial killer stash. It didn't take long for the cops to understand that they might have a maniac on their hands, and they had the phone call from Bundy's lover in their records, and they had his car description from one of the abductions. Still, after searching his house, the police didn't have enough to keep him. One thing they didn't find that day was a bunch of photographs of his dead victims. Things would have been very different had they discovered those awful snaps. Bundy was on the loose again, but he was being monitored all day long. Please, did, did I miss it? Did they say the names of these police departments? Because they dropped the ball so bad on this, man. So bad. Could you imagine dropping a ball like that today with social media? <laughs> Yo, that police department's name would be branded across every platform. So many people would have made blogs about it. So many people would have been, <laughs> they're lucky. They are lucky. Cause this is one of the biggest fumble jobs I've ever seen. This is the Mark Sanchez uh, butt tackle scene. Like that's how bad they screwed this play up. That's uh, Mark Sanchez running into to, to the butt of his own lineman. That's how bad they screwed this up. Some of the cops flew to Seattle to speak to Bundy's lover. She told them that some things just didn't add up, such as why did he keep crutches in his house? And what about that plaster of Paris? Not to mention the surgical gloves, big knives, meat cleaver, and a bag full of women's clothes. Bundy was certainly in a fix now, but he was by no means done. He sold his beloved beetle, but that was soon sequestered by investigators who gave the interior a good going over. What they found were strands of hair from females, and those females were very likely victims of murder. Police brought Bundy in and put him in a lineup, but they only had enough evidence to possibly put him on trial for aggravated kidnapping and attempted criminal assault. 
His parents paid his $15,000 bail and off he went, once again, a free man, but under heavy round-the-clock surveillance. Nah, why didn't they investigate it? Ask the parents, interview the parents. I'd love to see that video. He actually lived with his lover again while he was on bail, which should have been a very strange time for her. At this point, the lead investigators from Utah, Washington, and Colorado all finally got together and shared their stories and what evidence they had. They were pretty darn sure that they had a serial killer on their hands, and an utterly depraved one at that. Before they could get him for murder, though, he faced trial for kidnapping and assault. He was found guilty and sentenced to 1 to 15 years in the Utah State Prison. While in there, he was charged with just one of the murders. Bundy was a desperate man around this time, likely knowing that his crimes or most of them would catch up with him and he'd be looking at the death penalty. He chose to defend himself, and because of that he didn't have to wear handcuffs or leg shackles in court. On one of those court appearances, he managed to convince the court he needed the library and he leapt from a window. He actually survived for six days around the wilderness of the Aspen Mountains, but was eventually picked up by the cops. The case against him for that one murder was actually quite weak, but it seemed that Bundy believed they would get him. If he was done for that case, more cases might follow. Over a period of six months, he got his hands on a floor plan of the jail. He saved money after getting it smuggled in by visitors, and he also got himself a hacksaw. On December 30th, 1977, Bundy filled his bed with books, so it might look like he was sleeping. He then got through the ceiling and into an apartment. There, he changed into civilian clothes and then he walked out of the jail. He went from Chicago to Atlanta to Florida in stolen cars, only stopping to steal certain items or wallets from people. On January 15, 1978, he walked around at night in Florida State University. In the early hours of the morning, he assaulted, bludgeoned, strangled, and bit three sleeping women in three different rooms, all within about 15 minutes. Two of them survived but were very badly injured. He left the sorority house and went to an apartment building where he viciously attacked another girl, fracturing her skull and jaw. There he left behind one of his favorite things, his pantyhose mask. Police also found sperm and hair samples. Bundy later drove to Jacksonville where he abducted and killed a 12-year-old girl. A few days later, he was stopped by a police officer. During questioning, he kicked the man's legs and ran for it. The cop fired warning shots, but Bundy kept running. He was too slow, he was tackled, and in spite of his best efforts, he couldn't get the gun from the cop. Bundy was done for, sat in a car, handcuffed, on his way to certain death. Still, this Florida policeman didn't know who he had in the car. He was not aware that he was carrying one of the USA's most wanted fugitives. He certainly had no idea that the occupant of his vehicle would become known as one of the worst, most vile serial killers of all time. A demon whose warped brutality knew no bounds. And do you know what Bundy said to the cop while he was in the car? He said, I wish you had killed me. Eventually, he confessed to 30 murders, but there could have been many more. On January 24, 1989, age 42, Bundy took his final breaths in the electric chair. His last words were, I'd like you to give my love to my family and friends. Now, you need to watch this. Who are the most evil serial... Ted Bundy, man. Still trying to figure out what made him tick. They're still trying to figure out if there are any more bodies out there. They just don't know. They just don't know, man. So, prayers for the family. Prayers for the victims. And, uh... It's, it's just still one of the most, I don't know, man, just just confusing. Like, just you just you would never have thought somebody would do what he did ever, especially to that extent. Listen, man, when you go to work tomorrow in your professional office, look to the left and right of you, man. Somebody in there has a secret. It could be like Ted Bundy, bros. Careful who you trust, you know? <laughs> y'all get at me in the comment section. Let me know what y'all think, man. Be safe out here today, election day, man. And stick around and stay tuned to the next reaction of my piece. Y'all stay solid. Hey.